imagine you're reading a novel. The plot is gripping, but what really draws you in is the character development, the imagery, emotions, metaphor, symbolism. These are all deliberate choices by the author, and by the second time around, you not only read what's written, but you also start to understand what's been left out. Yes, I was an English major, but now I also read places. The shape of a place tells its story. The story of a local hero, cast in bronze. Who was that figure, cast in bronze? Did he, yes, he is always a he, win the war single-handedly? What was the agenda of the people in power who commissioned that statue? What did they want you to believe when you stood looking up at the soles of those shiny boots? What does this statue tell us about what our society values? Think of your neighborhood monument. It might be in the likeness of a 19th century author or a politician who happened to call your town home for a little while. Maybe a military hero. Or think of a memorial which you may have visited on a high school trip. You may have been to the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., or the memorial to murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. Think of what you did there and what you felt. Those memorials are monolithic and sobering. They are grand in scale and prominently located. They were commissioned for these spaces to reflect the importance of the events they pay tribute to. And the shine of the Vietnam War Memorial makes a great reflective surface for selfies. And the staggered heights of the marble slabs at the Holocaust Memorial are great for picnics and for playing hide-and-go-seek. I've been to both of these memorials and felt their gravitas but also I didn't know what to do. What do you do with your hands? I walked through, looked around, and left. Actually, the Holocaust Memorial is on my route between home and work, and I find myself going out of my way to avoid it. So for that reason, I guess it serves its purpose. It's a gut punch reminder to genocide. But also, I get upset seeing tourists pose for photos in front of it. The actions of the bronze man likely influenced and shaped our history, sometimes even in Google. However, how many times have you passed by the statue and haven't stopped, let alone thought about it? Monuments and plaques honor history and tell important stories. Along with state-sanctioned history books, they shape our public memory. However, they're not built for us to engage with them and can impose simplified or dominant narratives. Which stories are told, how, by whom, and for whom reflect on shared values, past, present, and future. I recently had the honor of contributing to the story of a place, which I hope expresses values of collaboration and deep healing. In the last 20 or so years, the historic Jewish neighborhood of Kazimierz in Krakow, Poland, has transformed from a derelict to a thriving creative and tourist area. This part of the city, which was forcibly emptied of its Jewish population during World War II, was left fallow until the fall of the Soviet Union. Since then, artists and restaurants and bars have revitalized the area. 64,000 Jews once called this neighborhood home. It is estimated that 90% of them were killed during World War II. Few who survived returned. Now, walking the streets, you'll find souvenir shops with signs written in font that draws from Hebrew script. Cafes hang larger-than-life-sized portraits of former Jewish residents who were most likely gassed in Auschwitz. Tour agencies advertise riverboat tours, 
next to the salt mine tours, next to tours of concentration camps. There's a bar and a former synagogue. What we see is the trauma turned into spectacle and used for commercial gain. The way we treat our past is the way we move into the future. Already, the neighborhood's commercialization and kitschy veneer risk desensitizing residents and visitors of Kashmir to its traumatic history. The challenge is, how do we make public memory personal? Instead of turning history and traumatic events into spectacle, a Disneyland of horror, what if we turned first inward to reflect and then outward to contribute to collectively honoring memory and keeping history alive? I was presented with this challenge when I was invited to create a public art piece for the 30th Jewish Culture Festival in Kazhmaj this summer. The piece I developed is called 64,000 Stones. With the help of curators and volunteers, we installed three glass-fronted cabinets in well-traveled areas of the corridor. Each of the shelves of the cabinet were filled with piles of gold-painted stones, 64,000 of them. Each stone symbolizing one of the 64,000 Jewish people who had once built a life in Krakow. Inscribed on the doors of the cabinets was the following invitation, written in Polish and English. Laying small stones on top of graves is a common Jewish tradition. Take these stones and carry them with you whenever and wherever you feel called to do so, lay them to rest. The piece invited passers-by to participate in the Jewish act of remembrance. But rather than leaving stones on graves, treating the whole city as a site of reflection and as a site which has the potential to store the permanence of memory. I've mentioned metaphor and symbolism, so let's unpack this a little bit. The stones were a local limestone because there's a quarry in the middle of the city which was founded by Jewish families, then appropriated by the Nazis, mined by Jewish slave labor, and then used as a set for Schindler's List. We painted the stones gold to highlight the contrast between the permanence of memory and stones and the fleeting sheen of a souvenir. We installed the stones in Ikea cabinets which we placed on the street. This presentation mirrored the looting of, Jew of Jewish homes in the neighborhood and also through the potentially familiar cabinets signaled to the viewer that past events are intimate and could happen again. Also, they were within budget. We invited passers-by to take stones and carry them with them. This reflects the common position of tourists as those who take whether it be memories or souvenirs or selfies, while not really leaving anything behind except for money. But we then invited them to leave the stones where they felt the need to mark a place, either for mourning, remembrance, or a promise to the future. We inverted the standard tourist act of extraction. The piece invites the visitor first to take but then to mourn and to leave something behind. By doing so, they are able to participate in a living memorial, one that grows and shifts with time. A gold-painted stone added to another memorial marks that, yes, this ghetto existed then, and against all odds, you exist now. A gold-painted stone in a field in Transylvania marks your intention to leave your current home and resettle here. The stories being told were not limited to Krakow. Within the first week of installation, stones were cited in numerous Polish cities as, and as far away as Hungary. I like to believe that they're now traveling the world, tiny golden limestone rocks, telling stories about how events that happened years ago have ripple effects into our lives today. Unlike the bronze statue that I mentioned earlier, this piece is open to personal interpretation. 
It can only be fully realized with the help of hundreds, if not thousands, of collaborators. The stones themselves are permanent, but their configuration and the hands which may hold them are constantly changing with time. I did not write a history book or carve the statue. I merely presented the public with the tools to make the memorial themselves and collaborate with one another by marking their grief. I would like to believe that 64,000 stones is a new pathway to process recent history and honor lives cut short. And there are many communities like Kajimej that are grappling with their traumatic history today. Very rarely are our residents and visitors given the opportunity to stop, process, and reflect on the stories of a place. Even more rare opportunities to be a part of writing the stories themselves, and in doing so, honoring that history and the effects that it still has on people today. Place holds memory. Every street, neighborhood, and city tells a unique story of the people who have shaped it and the events that have played out on its stage. The challenge really is to do these stories justice. I propose that we do this by inviting current and future residents and visitors to tell these stories with us. <laughs>